that's great. I am gonna leave this thing alone. It seems a bit, uh, a bit wobbly. The historical voice. The historical voice speaks when the fire's done burning. At a distance that is far, but not inconceivably far from here. In its vowels, the atlas bear and the tiger go on living. The handful of things it tells us have been said before and will be again, but it knows you're not the only person left who failed to listen. Difficult words like shame, fatigue, and dishonor take shelter in its lexicon. Nothing is dull but shines in its notice. It can fold time, bringing two apparently unconnected matters together in combinations meant to reconfigure your sense of scale. A pin and a pinwheel galaxy, a black hole and a feather. It has no discoverable loyalties, neither male nor female, foreign or known. Its accents come from anywhere but here. The syntax it likes is clean, perhaps translated. Rats and horses often appear, but metaphor is rarer than the similes it finds to be more true and underrated. Knowing the worst, it speaks from that shadow. We, it says, including itself, we are like this. What has occurred cannot be hidden, perhaps not understood. It tends to be more kindly than severe, less grave than good-humoured, as if in exhausted agreement that we all now comprehend the long half-life of cruelty, that love alone, however prone it seems, can, like a cockroach, survive most ends. It talks like this, of love, without incurring your disfavour. So uh, it's very nice to be here. This is the, the first time uh, we have read in Manchester since we moved here just about three months ago. Um, we're just getting used to the city, and getting our bearings, and it's very, very good and very exciting so far. So thank you very much for, for having us, and, and thank you for that introduction, Evan. I wanted to um, thank the musicians as well, wherever they've gone, maybe they've vanished, um, for, uh, for making me feel ignorant. Um, <laughs> It's a very enjoyable feeling to be confronted again with an art form that you don't know that much about. I, I, I don't know how to read, as it were, that kind of music. And it's nice to be in that, uh, that space of unknowing again. Um, I think it's good to, to put yourself back there every so often. Um, that was a new poem that I started with, and I'm going to read mostly new poems today, despite the very nice things that Evan said about my first book. Um, I feel like it's been a few years now and my second book's basically finished. Um, so it's good for me to read from where I am at the moment and it's, it's nice to kind of stay on that leading edge, I think, a little bit. So the, the book is called Disinformation, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with that term. It refers to the um, di dis dissemination of deliberately false information, usually by a government or one of its agents. Um, to foreign powers or to the media or even you know, to its own citizens. So I've been thinking a lot about those, uh, those ideas. The first, um, not the first poem, the second poem is, actually this was a commission, it's quite nice to, to read this in an art gallery. It was a commission for the National Gallery in London last year um, when they were putting on their, an exhibition of Titian paintings that had not been displayed together, I think, for a couple of hundred years. They were his um, Diana paintings. And they asked a few poets, including myself, to write a poem in response to these pictures and in response to Ovid's metamorphoses, um, particularly looking at the story of Diana and Actaeon. Uh, so Actaeon glimpses Diana bathing in the woods one day when he shouldn't see her naked and she hurls this handful of water at him because she's put her weapons aside and this uh, begins the transformation of Actaeon into a, a stag and he is eventually torn apart by his own hounds. It's a, it's a familiar story to most of us here I'm sure. 
So I was asked to write about this, um, and I wanted to do, try and do something that was really my own. I think this is one of the hardest things about responding to other art forms, um, is, is not to just take what's there already and try and appropriate it. It's actually to find a new way of entering into a relationship with that, with that painting or that piece of work. So I focused on the death of Actium, which shows Actium in the process of transforming, and, and Diana is there with her bow ready to ready to shoot him, which I think was an elaboration of Titian's. Um, and I was very interested, not by the deer and hounds, which seemed a bit tired to me, so I left that alone, um, but by the way that uh, Actian seemed to be painted in very similar colours to the backdrop, and it was almost as if he was being made to disappear into the woodland where he was um, being hunted. And it made me think um, about ideas of sort of denial and refusal and silence in the construction of political narratives. And I had these ideas about Diana was essentially silencing him and, and making him disappear because his existence was inconvenient to her. So this is the poem that, that came out of that. And it's called Woodland Burial. Thrown water touched him. And where it touched his said, his body was the same brownness leaves turn when autumn is upon us a swept-up heap trembling where it stood. That when the huntress concentrated, trees, tree shadows, underbrush and bushes made a wood, and it was ever thus, that nothing can be other than as known by a god, no truth a lie, no death long sleep. Poised with springy longbow drawn and back to the sun, the one who had revealed her form from landscape or eyes, independent as a streak of white paint on a mirror, held him on her gaze and held the torn canopy of clouds on the water, how she might have kept a spoonful of honey in the warm fold of her tongue before it dissipated. Not the greatest possible harm which needs to be known and named as such to achieve its end. Not what he fled, but the unofficial crime. The moment she let her attention crop those deep recursive avenues of beach to a backdrop he broke against, confused. So nothing in the landscape escaped his touch and nothing left of him was in the picture she composed. Um, this is called Pyramid, and I promise a shorter introduction for this one. Um, when I wrote this, I was thinking about the, the financial crisis as such. Um, I, I don't tend to write from things that are very immediately relevant, very kind of in the current news stories or anything like that, but this was one of those rare occasions, and I'll, I'll actually read another one in a minute that was also one of those occasions. Um, I was looking out over the skyline and I saw all of these cranes that were in the process of building new houses, new flats, and all of this kind of uh, intense development activity that had been going on in the last few years, but they weren't moving. This was about three years ago, so just when it had really begun to bite, and I realised that all these building sites had been shut down um, because of lack of funding, presumably. So I was thinking about that visual image, and that's what got the poem going. Um, but I also found myself remembering, as I was writing it, when I was about 17 and I really needed some money, um, very naively answering one of those adverts in the newspaper for kind of, you know, want to make 200 pounds a week kind of thing. Um, and it was this horrible kind of door-to-door -door, um, pyramid scheme type thing. And I sat in this woman's living room and watched this really cheesy video and then sort of escaped as fast as I could. Um, but I was thinking about that, about the way that pyramid schemes work and about that pyramid shape and this idea of economic imbalance. I suppose, and, and that became the sort of central image for the poem. So this is Pyramid. All along the skyline, cranes quiet above rooftops, conspicuous as knives dropped vertically into carpet, folded ironing board upright, or set at right angles, corner brackets bolting the sky to the ground. They dangle claws on chains, unbaited hooks balanced by elevated breeze blocks into the unfinished town, fishing a pond that hasn't been stocked. Their paintworks bright as max in rain, or the mops and pans a woman once persuaded me to sell 
door to door, describing in the air of her living room a pyramid, most mysterious of all mysterious extancies, her red nail climbing floors to the vertex where it stood or floated, as she effortlessly said, in no time at all, you'll have a lifestyle just like mine. Through the crane's necks, the cloudburst rings. Across the clad stone hotel, still missing its penthouse, its punchline, bucketing down like the old cartoon where a skeleton drinks champagne. Okay. Um, this, um, so yes, this is the other poem I mentioned um, that had a sort of topical beginning. This was in 2010 when the um, Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico and I was seeing these sort of fascinating, I mean awful, awful, horrible images um, coming through the news to me. Um, and they kind of triggered something off. And actually at the time I was reading a lot of Elizabeth Bishop, who is one of my absolute favourite poets. I think she's fantastic, as do many other people I know. Um, and I was, I was thinking about her and about the time that she had spent, um, particularly in Florida, kind of writing these coastal poems, coastal landscape poems, and I've been reading a lot of them and thinking about them. And this kind of bishop influence sort of seeped into and sort of blending with these um, images that were coming in from the uh, coast of Louisiana, it was. And I ended up writing one of those poems. I guess a little kind of tradition of them in the 20th century of sort of take X famous poet and Y um, location that they never actually visited and sort of put them together. Michael Hoffman has a poem called Rambo on the Hudson, for example. Um, so this is kind of in that tradition. This is Bishop in Louisiana. Twelve days since I took up my post in this village, a handful of clapboard houses crowded round the harbour and the concrete yards glittering with scales where church groups serve up grits and tamales from long trestle tables and the interiors of white vans. I myself eat at the hotel, beef, pasta, anything but fish, watching the Black Sea break foamlessly against the chemical barricades. On its surface, orange curds ride like surfboats, sorry, ride like surfboards or children's life preservers. After dinner, I take my coffee in the privacy of my suite. There is little to accomplish here. I walk on the beach where the nests of common terns driven upwind to breed are marked with red flags mounted on popsicle sticks, hundreds of them bunting in the wind. Each nest is no more than a dint in the sand, easily made with a fist. Yesterday I saw a dead sea turtle turning to soup inside its own shell. I am not immune to the irony of this. I write checks for the fishermen fitting their boats with booms to skim the water and speak to sad newscasters under a fly past of helicopters and a crop duster salute. Try to imagine what a hundred million litres means. You can't. At night before bed, in the surprisingly deep bath, I push my big toe into the streaming faucet and feel its pressure build to a hot, relentless gush, nightmarishly pleasurable, like pissing myself in my sleep. Yes, okay. Um, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna read one, I'm gonna read one very short poem from the book. You kind of should, shouldn't you? Um, I'm very, uh, despite these news story poems, I'm very interested in, as Paul Muldoon put it, writing what you don't know. There's this kind of um, hoary old saying in creative writing, isn't there? Write what you know, write what you know, it'll be more authentic and I'm, uh, I don't prescribe to that, honestly. I don't, I'm not really that interested in that idea. I think it's much more of a piece with my experience of writing poetry that you don't know where you're going as you write a poem. And it's about constructing something, con constructing some object or some landscape that didn't exist before. Um, 
and I'm particularly kind of had this moment of being very interested in writing about places that I hadn't visited before. So I have never been to Louisiana. Um, and this poem, which is the, the poem that gave me the, the title of my first book, which was Public Dream, um, is about Scandinavia, which I haven't visited either. Um, and I'm, I'm very intrigued by this, the kind of longing that countries that you haven't been to can inspire in you. And this idea of a sort of imaginary trespass as well, of, of writing about something you don't know firsthand. Um, there's something a little bit, I don't know, slightly risky or slightly dangerous about that. So this is called Scandinavia. I think I could be happy there, north of fame, in light unbroken, blending the imagined hours' horizons into sky, sky through soft heaped fields unclaimed, their rims forever reforming at the wind's deft caprice. I could try to live as a glass of water, utterly clear and somehow restrained, a sip that tells you nothing but perpetuates the being there. Could sit, lie, settle down, the white of one idea entirely lost upon another, as rain is lost in the shift of the sea, as a single consecrated face drowns in the swell of the Saturday host, and the notion of loving, that one critically more than any other flake in a flurry melts, flows back sorry, melts, flows back to Folly's pool, the lucid public dream. Sometimes you know poems so well that you can't actually read them straight through anymore. Get, uh, get tongue-tied. Okay. Um, I don't have a watch on. Are we... Do we know? Sorry. Five minutes, that's great. Okay. Um, I will read two more in that case. So, uh, this, I don't think this poem needs um, very much of an introduction. It's called Story, um, and it, it, this, this does fit very well, I think, with the whole disinformation idea, and I'll leave you to think about that. Story. Under what tree, in what part of the forest, Beside which branch of the leaf-obstructed stream, in sun or in rain, concreted into what foundation, supporting whose house, deaf to how many dinner parties, subjected to how many holding forths, Compacted along with what model of car, with what registration, wearing which perfume and what sort of pearls, in the back of beyond of what country, adjoining whose underdevelopment land, masked by which strain of animal fodder's pollen blown from the next field along, belonging to whom, missed by whom, questioned by which particular method, scarred where, repaired where, reopened how, broken how, how taken care of, transported how, buried how, in what manner and from what platform disclaimed, during which international crisis, during which electoral year, under whose watch, under whose watch and why will it surface, why will it then be permitted to surface, the end of the story, the body we need. So this, um, this last poem was uh, inspired by the Pitt Rivers Anthropological Museum in Oxford. I don't know if any of you have been to this amazing place. Um, it was uh, founded, I think, in the 19th century, very end of the 19th century, and it's absolutely stuffed with these amazing um, textiles and weaponry and cooking implements, um, mostly collected by John Pitt Rivers himself, but then sort of contributed to still over the years. And their, um, their prize exhibit is they have nine or ten shrunken human heads in the museum. 
And these heads uh, came from Ecuador and Peru, from a, a scattering of different tribes in that area. Over a period of about 30 years, they were brought across to the museum. And I, I just became very, very interested in these things. After I, I was a student in Oxford, and I saw them when I was there, and then I found myself thinking about them again a few years ago, and doing a bit of reading and research, and not just about them and where they came from, but about the kind of debates around them. Um, very pressing debates at the late 20th century in Western museums about what to do with human artifacts, whether they should be retained by the museum or repatriated um, for ethical reasons. Um, and these, these heads are still in Oxford, partly because nobody has asked for them back yet, um, and partly because they wouldn't be sure who to give them back to anyway, because all the territorial lines and so on have been redrawn so many times uh, in the last hundred years, so it's quite a tricky area. I was really interested in the reasoning behind the shrinking of the heads too, which is not just, it's not just an act of vengeance. In fact, it is not really an act of vengeance. Um, the killing itself normally was uh, sort of tribal feuds. Um, but once the warrior had been killed, um, the process of sort of removing the skin from the skull and, and boiling it for hours until it was fit in the palm of your hand was actually about inducting the soul of that warrior into the tribe of the warrior who had killed him. So it was a kind of kinship ritual. And I was really interested in that, and I sort of found myself wondering whether if these heads hypothetically still had any kind of consciousness, if having been in the Pit Rivers Museum for as long as they have been, they might now feel some kind of tribal kinship with the other artifacts in the museum, rather than, you know, the tribes they had actually belonged to in life. So, this is a... Uh, this is a poem kind of using those ideas, and it's a deliberately problematic act of appropriation um, to write in the voice of this shrunken head, who is being sent home, um, even though he doesn't really want to go. A shrunken head. In the cargo hold, cruising at 30,000 feet above blue islands, galactically cold, I float between Oxford and the sites where I was found, then traded on. I cannot see for bubble wrap. At this stage in my repatriation, I belong to no one. A blip, a birdie ounce in the undercarriage. Only the curator knows I've gone and who is left. She redesigns the tour. Lizard bones replace me. Indigenous crafts distract with dyed feathers from an absence. So in me, no memory withstood the leather-thonged, moth-kissed costume of an Eskimo, its upright hood ringed with reindeer fur like frost, regarding me for years without a face across the Victorian cabinets, or a cruel, long spear frozen in space, dressed like a wrist with jade and jet. Or Bobo, as I named him, his heavy puss pursed like a clown's, like a freshly sprung mushroom, observing silence. I miss being part of the known quantifiable index, the massive mouths of children smearing the glass case, sometimes shocked and crying, more often delighted to learn of my fate, sneaking pictures for school reports. Their flashes filled me up with light as water would a calabash, or the cauterizing beams of night security did the displays. For hours after, I'd see patterns that couldn't be real, shadow plays, huge birds fighting each other up the loaded walls. I'd imagine hands to rub my eyelids with, lift them and feel the cross stitches holding me in, my vengeful breath trapped beneath their seals, wanting for the first time in lifetimes to exhale, to spit red berries or the prattle of a curse. Then that would fail in the force of my several injuries, and I'd seem to drop towards a far ocean, Armless, footless, a seed head blown without will or hope or wishing upon through the middle of a crown to land on my shelf under rows of wooden masks and blown bird's eggs, smelling the open jar of myself, salt sweet as tamarisk, mild as figs. 
Thank you very much. Thank you.